Eleanor Catherine Carlyle, you stand charged upon this indictment with the murder of Mary Gerard upon the 27th of July, 1938. How do you plead? Are you guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. We present Agatha Christie's Sad Cypress with Emma Fielding as Eleanor Carlyle and David McAllister as Dr. Lord. someone sucking up to your Aunt Laura. And if you're not careful, you'll get cut out of everything. Girls are very artful, and old ladies is soft when young ones suck up to them and flatter them. <laughs> I say. What I say is, you'd best come down and see for yourself what's going on. It's not right you and the young gentleman should be done out of what's yours. And she's very artful, and the old lady might pop off at any time. A well-wisher. When did you get this? Arrived by the morning's post. I was going to tear it out, but I thought you ought to read it first. How extraordinary people are. Whoever could have written it? One of the servants, I suppose. And who do you think the uh, the person is, the one mentioned in the letter? I can only suppose that it must be Mary Gerard. Mary Gerard? Who's she? Oh, you must remember her, Roddy. She's the daughter of the people who keep the lodge. Aunt Laura's always been fond of her. She paid for her schooling, arranged for her to have piano lessons, all that sort of thing. Oh, yes, I remember her now. We used to play with her when we were kids. She was uh, scrawny, all legs and arms, with a lot of messy fair hair. She's not like that now. It's a long time since you've been down at Hunterbury. She's been abroad, au pair in Germany. She's a nice-looking girl now and quite sophisticated. You'd never take her for old Gerard's daughter. And has she really been sucking up to Aunt Laura? I wouldn't say that exactly. I suppose she is up at the house a good deal. She reads aloud to Aunt Laura since she had a stroke. Why can't the nurse read to her? <laughs> nurse O'Brien's got a brogue and cut with a knife. I don't wonder Aunt Laura sends for Mary. You know, Eleanor, I believe we ought to go down. Because of this stupid letter? Oh, no, of course not. Well, d to be honest, yes. I, I mean, I know one shouldn't let oneself be influenced by things like this, but you never know. There may be some truth behind it. I mean, the old girl is pretty ill. Yes, she is. And we don't go down there as often as we should. You don't, you mean? And the money does matter. To you and me, Eleanor. Just a drop of milk, is that it? That's it. And no sugar? No sugar. There we are. Thank you. Oh, I don't know what I do without you coming round every morning to give me a hand with Mrs. Wellman. No. Oh. oh, there always seems so much to do, and the girls are worse than useless. It makes such a difference to have another qualified nurse around. Well, I'm not exactly rushed off my feet down in the village. They're a healthy lot round here. Oh, Mr Wellman and Miss Carlyle are coming down. There was a telegram this morning. I thought the old lady looked excited about something. Oh, it'll be nice for her to see her niece and nephew. He isn't her real nephew. Well, her husband's nephew. I always thought it was a pity she never had any children of her own. It must be some time since they were down here. Two months at least. Such a nice young gentleman, Mr Wellman, but very proud looking. I saw Miss Carlyle's picture in the Tatler the other day oh. with some smart society lot at Newmarket. Oh, she always has such lovely clothes. Do you think she's good looking? Well, difficult to tell what these girls really look like under all their makeup. <laughs> she hasn't got anything like the looks of Mary Gerard. Mm, oh, well, you may be right, but Mary hasn't got the style. Fine feathers make fine birds. Funny thing happened last night. What? I went in at two o'clock to see that Mrs. Wellman was all right. And she was lying there, wide awake. She must have just come out of a dream. Because as soon as I came in, she says, the photograph. Mm -hmm. I must have the photograph. What? So I said, of course, Mrs. Wellman. Do you mean the one of Mr. Roderick? And she said, not Roderick. Lewis. And then what happened? Well... She told me to unlock the second drawer of the tall boy. And there, sure enough, 
was a big photograph in a silver frame. Oh, oh such a handsome man. It must have been taken years ago. But I took it to her, and she held it there and stared at it for a long time. Oh. She just murmured, Lewis, Lewis. She gave it back to me and told me to put it away in the tall boy. Was it her husband, do you think? But no, no, it wasn't. Mr. Wellman's first name was Henry. No, oh, he must have been a boyfriend oh. a long time ago. <laughs> I wonder what became of him. Perhaps he was killed in the Great War. Uncle Henry must have been pretty well off when he met your Aunt Laura. And she was an heiress. She's always been very shrewd over money matters. Not like my father. He never had any business sense. And Uncle Henry left everything to her. It's tragic he's dying so soon. I've always wondered why she never married again. Just as well for our sake that she didn't. She's always been very good to us. If I've been in a hole, she's always helped me out. She's been very generous to me, too. Just as well, considering what your means really are. If it weren't for old Aunt Laura, you'd probably have to work for your living, and you wouldn't like that much. Well, you're not exactly burdened down with work yourself. Oh, <laughs> have you know? I put in three hours every day at Lewis and Home. But I can't say I worry much about the future. Not with our expectations from Aunt Laura. I suppose it must be the Gerard girl the letter refers to. There just isn't anybody else it could be. Oh, hello. Nurse Hopkins, can you spare me a minute? Of course I can, Mary. What's the trouble? Trouble isn't really the right word. I need a bit of advice. <laughs> I'll do the best I can. It's just the time is going on and on, and I'm not doing anything. I ought to get a job, earn my own living. Well, there's time enough for that, surely. That's what Mrs. Wellman's always telling me. But I can't see it like that. She's been wonderfully kind, but I want to make something of myself. I can't bear just sitting around doing nothing. I want to be training for a job. What kind of a job? That's why I want your advice. The trouble is that training of any kind is nearly always expensive. I know German pretty well now, and I might do something with that. But I really think I want to be a hospital nurse. I really do like nursing. It's hard work, Mary. That doesn't worry me. Mother's sister, the one in New Zealand, was a nurse, so it must be in the blood. If you'll take my advice, you should be patient for the present. I'm sure Mrs. Wellman would help you get a start at making your living. But she's done so much for me already. Nonsense. She owes you that. But the truth of the matter is that she's got fond of you and doesn't want to lose you. Do you really think so? I'm sure of it. There she is, poor old lady, more or less helpless, paralyzed down one side, and nothing and nobody to amuse her but you. means a lot to her to have a pretty young thing like you about the house. The best thing you can do is to stay where you are and stop worrying. It won't be for long. What's the matter? My father's coming out of the lodge. He never has a good word to say for me these days. Oh, I wouldn't take any notice. I can't help taking notice. Always going on about me being a fine lady and too good for him. Haven't you got anything better to do with yourself than stand round gossiping? Good morning, Mr. Gerard. Something the matter? Lumbago. That's what's the matter. Oh, the warm weather will soon clear that away. Uh, I suppose you think that because you're the district nurse, you know the answer to everything. <laughs> She wants to be a nurse. Did you know that? You'd think she'd want to be something better than that with her French and German and her piano playing. Oh, what use of her languages and all her airs and graces ever been to me? That's what I'd like to know. My, my. We are in a bad mood this morning, aren't we, Mrs. Gerard? Mary's a good girl and a good daughter to you, and you know it. She's no daughter of mine. You're ashamed of me, aren't you, Mary? That's where your learning and your fine ways have got you. <laughs> uh, you'd best be off to Mrs. Wellman's. At least you know which side your bread's buttered. You poor soul. Is he always like this? Always. He never liked me, even when I was a little girl. Mum always used to stand up for me. I'm then... sure he doesn't really mean it, Mary. Oh, he does. All the more reason for your devoting your time to Mrs. Wellman, then. She'll see you're provided for. Aunt Laura's never told us definitely just how she's left her money. That doesn't matter much either way. She's probably divided it between us. But if she's left most of it to you as her own flesh and blood, or left it all to me as the only male representative of the family, it will all come to the same thing once we're married. I suppose it will. You do love me, don't you, Eleanor? Yes. Yes. 
<laughs> You're adorable. So aloof, untouchable. La princesse lointaine. It's that quality of yours that made me love you, I believe. Is it? <laughs> but some women are so possessive. Or they look at you like a sick spaniel with their emotions slopping about all over the place. But with you, I never know. Any minute you might turn round in that cool, detached way of yours and say you'd changed your mind without batting an eyelid. I think ours will be the perfect marriage. I shall never get tired of you because you're such an elusive creature. I can't imagine myself ever looking at another woman. Such an adventure as this. A fine young man and a lovely young woman thrown together in such a way. So Emma thought at least... Leave off reading for a while, Mary. I want to talk to you. Of course, Mrs. Lowman. I'm very fond of you, my dear. You're very good to me. It's you who've been good to me. I don't know what I should have done if it hadn't been for you. You've done everything for me. Oh, I don't know about that. I only wish I did. One means to do the best one can, but it's so difficult to know what is best, what is right. I've been too sure of myself always. I'm sure you've always known what's best and right to do. No, I'm not certain anymore. It worries me. I've had one besetting sin always, Mary. I'm proud. Pride can be the devil. It runs in our family. Eleanor has it, too. It will be nice for you to have Miss Eleanor and Mr. Roderick down. It'll cheer you up. It's quite a time since they were here. They're young and happy with the world in front of them. No need to bring them near decay and suffering before their time. I'm sure they'd never feel like that, Mrs. Wellman. I always hoped they might marry. But I've never tried to suggest anything of the kind. That would have been sure to put them off. I had an idea long ago when they were children that Eleanor had set her heart on Roddy. But I wasn't at all sure about him. He's such a funny creature, very reserved and fastidious. Henry was like that. Your husband? So long ago, so very long ago. We'd only been married for five years when he died. We were happy, very happy, but somehow it all seems very unreal, that happiness. I was an odd, solemn, undeveloped girl, my head full of ideas and hero worship. No reality. And afterwards, you must have been very lonely. Oh, yes, terribly lonely. I was only 26, and now I'm over 60. Long time to spend on your own, my dear. A long time. And now, this. Your illness. A stroke is the thing I've always dreaded. The indignity of it. Washed and tended like a baby. Helpless to do anything for myself. I can't abide it. Nurse O'Brien is a good soul. She doesn't mind my snapping at her. But it makes a lot of difference to me to have you about, Mary. Does it? Does it really, Mrs. Wellman? You've been worrying, haven't you? What do you mean? About the future. About what's going to happen to you. Yes, I suppose I have. You leave it to me, my dear. I'll see to it that you shall have the means to be independent and take up a profession. But be patient for a little. It means so much to me to have you here. Of course I will. I wouldn't leave you for the world. Not if you want me. I do want you, Mary. You're almost like a daughter to me. I've seen you grow up here at Hunterbury from a little toddling thing. Seen you grow into a beautiful girl. I'm proud of you, child. I only hope I've done my best for you. I'm very grateful. I don't have to tell you that. Father says you've educated me above my station and given me fine lady ideas. But it isn't true. If I want to start earning my own living, it's because it's time I should. I don't like it to be thought that I'm sponging on you. Pay no attention to your father, Mary. There never has been and never will be any question of your sponging on me. I'm asking you to stay on here solely on my account. It will be over soon. Is that a car? I'll go and see. Yes, Miss Eleanor and Mr Roderick have arrived. I'd better be going. Welcome home, Miss Eleanor, Mr Roderick. Thank you, Mrs Bishop. Good to see you. How is my aunt? Much as you might expect. No change. She'll be all the better for seeing you. It's time she had one of her own family to talk to. There's been far too much of a certain person about the place. Shall I go up? She's expecting you. I'll leave you to it, Eleanor. I think I'll take a turn around the garden. I'm very glad, Eleanor, about you and Roddy. I thought you would be, Aunt Laura. You do care about him. Of course. You must forgive me, Eleanor, but you're so reserved. It's difficult to know what you're thinking or feeling. When you were both much younger, I thought you were perhaps beginning to care for Roddy too much. Really? 
Yes, it's not wise to care too much. I care for Roddy enough and not too much. Then I think you'll be happy, my dear. Roddy needs love, but he doesn't like violent emotion. Possessiveness would frighten him off. How well you understand him. If Roddy cares for you just a little more than you care for him, well, that's all to the good. Aunt Agatha's advice column. Keep your boyfriend guessing. Don't let him be too sure of you. Are you unhappy, child? Is anything wrong? Oh, no, no. Nothing. You thought I was being rather cheap. Oh, my dear, you know, life is rather cheap, I'm afraid. I suppose it is. My dear child, you are unhappy. What is it? Oh, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Aunt Laura, do you think love is ever a happy thing? In the sense you mean, Eleanor, probably not. To care passionately for another human creature always brings more sorrow than joy. But all the same, Eleanor, no one would be without that experience. Anyone who's never really loved has never really lived. Yes, but you understand. You've known what it's like to love someone who... What is it? <clears throat> Sorry to disturb you, Mrs. Wellman, but the doctor's here. Well, show him in, nurse. Will you go in, Dr. Lord? Thank you. Good morning, Mrs. Wellman. I thought I'd just see how... Good morning, Dr. Lord. This is my niece, Eleanor Carlyle. Miss Carlyle, how do you do? Eleanor and Roddy have come down to breathe new life into me, Doctor. <laughs> I'm sure they will, Mrs. Wellman. Just what you need. I'd better go. Perhaps I shall see you before you leave, Doctor. Oh, uh, yes, of course. <laughs> I'll leave you then. Good-looking girl, isn't she? Uh, yes, I suppose so. You suppose so? You haven't looked at me since you came into the room. Let me take your pulse, Mrs. Wellman. <laughs> You're not fooling anyone, Dr. Lord. But go through your bag of tricks if you must. The trouble with me is that I've never learned the right bedside manner. Rest assured, Doctor, there's nothing wrong with your bedside manner, and you know it. <laughs> so, what's the verdict? You're coming along splendidly. So, I shall be up and walking round the house in a few weeks' time. Um... I wouldn't go that far. What humbugs you doctors are. What's the good lying stretched out on a bed like this and cared for like a baby? <sighs> Mrs. Wellman, you're one of the people who really want to live, whatever you may say about it. And if your body wants to live, it's no use your brain telling you that it doesn't. And what does your body tell you, Doctor? Do you really want to spend the rest of your life looking after self-centred old ladies in a village miles from anywhere? Don't you want to specialise? <laughs> The trouble with me, Mrs. Wellman, is that I've got absolutely no ambition. I don't really want to pin down the rare bacillus and obscure disease. I like measles and chicken pox and all the rest of it. I shall stay here till I grow side whiskers and people begin saying, Of course, we've always had Dr. Lord, but I suppose he is rather old-fashioned in his methods. Perhaps we'd better call in young so-and-so, who's much more up-to-date. <laughs> I don't believe a word of it. Now, I must be off on my rounds. Be sure to have a word with my niece before you go. I will, Mrs. Wellman. <laughs> and perhaps you can get one of the servants to find out where that nephew of mine has gone to. I know he doesn't care for sick beds, but he might at least put his head round the door. Don't you remember me, Mr. Wellman? Uh, no, uh, I'm sorry, I don't. Who are you? I'm Mary Gerard from the lodge. <laughs> You're Mary Gerard? It's been a long time since we played together as children. I must have changed a lot since you saw me. I wouldn't have recognised you as the same person. Mary Gerard. Miss Eleanor, it's very nice to see you. I hear you've been doing quite a lot to help my aunt. Not that much. Reading to her every now and then. Nurse O'Brien seems to think you're indispensable. She wants you to help lift my aunt. She says you usually do it with her. I'll go once, Miss Eleanor. And she wants to see you too, Roddy. I just can't believe it. You can't believe what? What? That that's the little girl from the lodge. We used to pull her hair and, and plow. Well, what about her? Well, nothing, really. I didn't recognise her, that's all. Oh, come on, Mary. They say it's a really good film. It's frightfully nice of you, Ted, but I really can't. I can't make you out nowadays, Mary. You're different, altogether different. 
Ever since you came back from Germany, you don't seem to have time for any of your old friends. That's not true, Ted. And I haven't changed, not really. Oh, yes, you have. You're almost a lady now. Almost isn't good enough, though, is it? No. I suppose it isn't. I'm sorry, Ted, but I must go. I'm late. Where are you off to, then? I'm going to have tea with Nurse Hopkins. Rather you than me. That woman's the biggest gossip in the village. She's been very kind to me, always. I'm not saying there's any harm in her, but she talks. Goodbye, Ted. Goodbye, Mary. Was that Ted Bigland you were talking to? Mm. He wanted me to go to the pictures with him. Well, of course, he's a nice young fellow in his way, and he's doing quite well at the garage. But I can't help thinking you ought to be setting your sights a bit higher. I've been thinking that myself. You ought to be getting about a bit. You shouldn't be burying yourself down here. Mrs. Wellman doesn't want me to go away just now. Sure she doesn't. Did she say anything about taking care of your future? She told me not to worry. She'd be making provision for me. Well, let's hope she puts it down in black and white. And Miss Eleanor and Mr. Roderick didn't stay long, did they? And they won't be back in a hurry. You can be sure of that. Roddy, I've been ringing you for ages. Where have you been? No one in particular. What's the matter? I had a telegram from Dr. Law this morning. Aunt Laura's had another stroke. Oh, poor old soul. Well, she seems so perky when we were down there. I do mind so terribly for her. I know how much she hated being ill anyway, and now she'll be more helpless still, and she'll simply loathe that. I can't help feeling that people ought to be set free if that's what they really want. You put animals out of their pain, why not human beings? Do you think we should go down? Of course, we must. Well, you're not still worrying about the will and Mary Gerard and all that. I'm worrying about Aunt Laura. Good evening, Nurse Hopkins. Good of you to come over. Glad to lend a hand, Doctor. Yes, Nurse O'Brien could do with a break. Tomorrow I'll try and get hold of the second resident nurse. Awkward with this diphtheria outbreak over at Stanford. Well, I'd better see what I can do. I'll leave my case down here. It won't be in the way. No, I'm sure it won't. I'd better go up, then. Is she any better, Doctor? I can ensure her a peaceful night, Mary. That's about all that can be done. It seems so unfair, so cruel. Such a kind, caring person. Ah, oh, Miss Carlyle. Sorry we're so late. Trouble with the car, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, Hello, Miss Gerard. Good evening, Mr. Wellman. Can I take your coat? Oh, thanks. Is my aunt very bad? You must be prepared for a bit of a shock, Miss Carlyle. She's badly paralysed. Her speech is almost unrecognisable. And uh, she's definitely worried about something. It seems to be about sending for her lawyer. Do you know who he is? Oh, yes, he's Mr. Seddon. His office is in Bloomsbury Square. But he wouldn't be there at this time of the evening, and I don't know his home address. Oh, tomorrow will be in plenty of time. I'm anxious to set Mrs. Wellman's mind at rest as soon as possible. Could you come up with me, Miss Carlyle? Of course. Y you don't want me? Not the least need, Mr. Wellman. Better not have too many people in the room. That's all right, then. Shall we go up? Yes, of course. Uh, uh, I'm here, Aunt Laura. Dr. Lord says you want me to send for Mr. Seddon. Is that right? <laughs> Mary? Mary Gerard? Uh, provision? Is that what you said? You want to make provision for her in your will? You want her to have some money? I'll telephone Mr. Seddon first thing in the morning and get him to come down straight away. Everything shall be arranged exactly as you wish. Come, we'll let her rest now. Good night, Aunt Laura. Dr. Lord, is it all right if I go in and see her for a moment? Yes, of course, Mary. Keep quiet, though, and don't disturb her. I won't. That was exactly what was needed. What? What did you say? That you were everything you should have been. Practical, reassuring. Is something the matter? Oh, no, nothing. It upset me terribly seeing her like that. Well, you didn't show it. You must have great self-control. I've learned not to show my feelings. All the same, the mask's bound to slip once in a while. The mask? The human face is, after all, nothing more nor less than a mask. And underneath? Underneath is the primitive man... Or woman. She seems to be sleeping peacefully. Thank you for letting me go into her. Good night, Doctor. Good night, Miss Carlyle. Good night. 
Good night, Mary. I'll be on my way, then. There's nothing more I can do for the moment. I'll look in early tomorrow. Goodbye, Miss Carlyle. Don't... Uh, don't worry too much. I'll try not to, Doctor. What's the poor old dear worrying about? She wants to see Seddon. I'll telephone first thing. Does she want to make a new will? Is that it? She didn't say so. Just something about wanting to make provision. For Mary? Yes, for Mary Gerard. Miss Carlyle! Oh. Miss Carlyle! What is it? Mrs Bishop, what's happened? It's your aunt, Miss Eleanor. Poor old lady passed away in her sleep. Aunt Laura's dead? Yes. She wouldn't have felt a thing. It was quite painless, Nurse Hopkins says. What a blessing for her. Strange that it should happen so suddenly, though. What was the doctor saying he'd call again this morning and everything as usual? It wasn't exactly sudden. After all, she'd been ill for some time. I'm just thankful that she was spared more suffering. What is it, nurse? Have you lost something? I can't find it, you were poor feeling. I could have sworn it was in my case when I left it down here last night. I gave Mrs. Wellman the last tablet of the old tube yesterday evening, and I was sure I had the new tube in here. Well, it must still be in your cupboard at home. It must be. But I did think I could trust my memory better than that. It was a full tube of morphine? Yes, it was. Nobody could have pinched it, could they? Of course not. Who'd do a thing like that? You've signed the death certificate then, Doctor. Of course I've signed it, Nurse. Is there any reason why I shouldn't? Natural causes. Of course. Natural causes. Do you mean to say that my aunt died in test states, that she never made a will at all? That seems to be the case, Mr. Wellman. Strong. Oh, not so extraordinary as you might imagine. It happens more frequently than you would think. There's a kind of superstition about it. People will think that they've got plenty of time. The mere fact of making a will seems to bring the possibility of death nearer to them. <laughs> Very odd, but there it is. But, Mr Seddon, did you never try to point out to her that she ought to make a will? Frequently, Miss Carlyle. And what did she say? Oh, the usual things. There was plenty of time. She didn't intend to die just yet that she hadn't made her mind up definitely exactly how she wished to dispose of her money. But surely, after she had her first stroke... No, no, it was worse then. She wouldn't hear the subject mentioned. Well, surely that's very odd. Oh, no. Her illness made her much more frightened. But she wanted to die. She said so to everyone. Ah, my dear Miss Helena, the human mind is a curious piece of mechanism. Mrs Wellman may have thought she wanted to die... But side by side with that feeling, there ran the hope that she would recover, absolutely. And because of that hope, I think she felt that to make a will would be unlucky. It wasn't so much that she didn't want to make one, as she was eternally putting it off. She kept telling herself that there was plenty of time. So that's why she was so upset last night, and in such a panic that you should be sent for. Undoubtedly. So what happens now? Since Mrs Wellman died in Tested, all her property goes to her next of kin... That is, to you, Miss Carlyle. All to me? The Crown takes a certain percentage. But what about Roddy? Doesn't he get anything? He is only Mrs Wellman's husband's nephew. There is no blood relationship. I, I don't think she would have thought of it that way. Unfortunately, the law does. But it doesn't matter, does it? Oh, for heaven's sake, Eleanor, I don't want the damn money. But I thought we'd agreed that it wasn't important which of us got it since we're getting married anyway. You said so. Don't you remember? I remember. We are going to marry one another, aren't we? Well, I understood that was the plan. Of course, Eleanor, if you've got other ideas... Then... I'm not the one who has other ideas. What do you mean? I think you know very well what I mean. <sighs> I just don't know what's happened to me. I do. Perhaps it's just that I don't quite like the idea of living on my wife's money. You know very well it's got nothing to do with that. I'm not blind. It's Mary Gerard, isn't it? 
I suppose it is. How did you know? It wasn't difficult. It's there in your face for anyone to read every time you look at her. I saw it again when we arrived here last night. I just don't know how it happened. That first time we came down here after the anonymous letter, I just took one look at her and... Everything got turned upside down. You can't understand. Yes, I can. Go on. I didn't want to fall in love with her. I was happy with you. It upset everything. All the decent, ordered, reasonable things. Love isn't very reasonable. No, it isn't. Have you said anything to her? This morning, I lost my head. I tried to talk to her. She shut me up at once. She said she didn't want to know about it. Because of Aunt Laura and... um, because of you. You'd better have your ring back, Roddy. (sighs) Thanks. Eleanor, you can't imagine how dreadful I feel. I do love you, you know. As much as ever, it's just that... It's like a dream. I might wake up from it and find she wasn't there. Is that what you want? What? For her not to be there. Sometimes I wish she wasn't. You, You and I belong, Eleanor. We do belong, don't we? Oh, yes. We belong, Roddy. But not with Mary Gerard around. You have to admit, it was a lovely funeral. Oh, it was. I never saw such beautiful flowers. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm wondering... If Mrs Wellman had made a will, how she would have left her money... I know one thing. What's that? She'd have left a sum of money to Mary Gerard. A sum of money? I'll tell you this, Miss Hopkins. It is my opinion she'd have left her every single penny she possessed. Oh, I don't think she'd have done that. She'd have looked after her own flesh and blood anyway. Mm, well, there's flesh and blood. I'm flesh and blood. Now, what on earth do you mean by that? <laughs> I've said enough. You won't find me blackening the memory of the dead. Did you find that tube of morphine? No, I didn't. Oh, it wasn't in the medicine chest. Can't imagine what I could have done with it. And you didn't leave your case anywhere else? No, of course not. I set it down in the hall when I arrived at Hunterbury. There it stayed. Oh, it is a mystery. I mean, it's not as if... Not as if what? Well, uh, no one would have taken it, surely. Well, I should, they? That's just what I think. I I wouldn't worry about it if I were you. I'm not worrying. I was told you wanted to see me, Miss Eleanor. Thank you for coming over, Mary. Sit down, will you? I think you know, Mary, that my aunt always took a great interest in you and was concerned about your future. Mrs. Wellman was very good to me always. My aunt, if she had lived to make a will, would have wished, I know, to leave several legacies... Since she died intestate, the responsibility of carrying out her wishes rests on me. Yes, Miss Eleanor. And though it was difficult for my aunt to speak coherently, she was able to make her meaning understood that last evening. She definitely wanted to make some provision for your future. That was very good of her. As soon as probate is granted, I'm arranging that £2,000 should be made over to you. The sum to be yours to do with absolutely as you please. Well, that's very kind of you, Miss Eleanor. I, I don't know what to say. It wasn't particularly kind of me, and please, don't say anything. You don't know what a difference it will make to me. I'm glad. Do you have any plans, Mary? Yes, I do. I want to train for something in nursing. Nurse Hopkins suggested that I take a course in London. That sounds a very good idea. I'll try to arrange with Mr Seddon that some money be advanced to you as soon as possible. That's very good of you, Miss Eleanor. It's got nothing to do with me. I'm merely fulfilling my aunt's wishes. Very generous, I'd have thought. Exactly right. You've always had excellent judgment. There's something else, Roddy. I want you to have your proper share of the money. Uh, No, Eleanor, I I don't want it. Half the money was your uncle's anyway. Eleanor, do you really want me to feel more of a heel than I already am? I don't want your money. But it isn't mine, don't you see? It's yours by law and that's all that matters. I I won't take a penny from you. You're not going to try your lady bountiful act on me. Roddy! I'm I'm sorry, Eleanor, forgive me. I, I didn't mean that. I, I'm just so confused about everything, that's all. Did um, did Mary tell you what she proposes to do? She said that she was going to train as a nurse in London. I see. Roddy, I want you to listen to me carefully. Yes, what is it? 
you're not particularly tied down, are you? You can always get a holiday, can't you? Oh, yes. Uh, no difficulty there. Then why don't you do just that? Well... We'll go abroad somewhere for, say, three months. But what's the idea? Look, at the moment you think you're in love with Mary Gerard. Perhaps you are. But this isn't the time to approach her. You know that only too well. Yes, I do. Our engagement is definitely broken off. Go abroad as a free man and, at the end of three months, make up your mind. You'll know then whether you really love Mary or whether it was just a temporary infatuation. And if you're quite sure you love her, well, then come back and tell her so and that you're quite sure about it. Perhaps then she'll listen. If you want to know my opinion, you've been very lucky, Mary. Miss Carlyle could quite conveniently have forgotten all about her aunt's wishes. And yet somehow I feel she doesn't like me. And with good reason, I should say. What do you mean? Oh, don't you play the innocent with me, my girl. I've seen the way Mr. Roderick follows you about making sheep's eyes at you. He's got it badly, hasn't he? I suppose he has. And what about you? Do you feel anything for him? I don't know. I don't think so. Don't be in too much of a hurry, my dear. With your looks, you can afford to pick and choose. What do you think I ought to do about father? He says I ought to give some of the money to him. Don't you do anything of the kind. Mrs. Wellman certainly never meant any of that money for him. It seems funny when she got all that money, she never made a will to say how it should go. People are like that, Mary. Always putting it off. It seems downright silly to me. Have you made a will, then? <sighs> what should I be doing making a will? I haven't got anything to leave. You have now. And quite a tidy little sum, too. Well, there's no hurry. There you go. Just because you're a healthy young girl doesn't mean you mightn't get run down by a bus, my dear. And who would get my money if I didn't make a will? I suppose it would go to your father. I certainly don't want him to have it. And as you say, Mrs. Wellman wouldn't have wanted it. You're right, I must make a will. But who should I leave it to? Haven't you got any other relatives? I've an aunt in New Zealand. Or oh, the one who's a nurse? Mm. I haven't heard from her for years. What's her name? Mary Riley. I was named after her. But can I leave the money to her just like that? I don't even know where she lives. Well, I imagine you just make it out to Mary Riley, sister of the late Elizabeth Gerard. Mm. The solicitors can always advertise in the New Zealand papers. I don't even know how to set about making a will. Oh, that's no problem. You can get a form at the post office. Glad to see someone looking so cheerful. What's the joke? Oh, Dr. Lord. I didn't see you. What joke? That's what I wanted to know. You were grinning all over your face. Oh, it's so silly. I looked in at Nurse Hopkins' cottage. She was sitting at the kitchen table with Mary Gerard. I asked what they were doing, and Mary said she was making her will. I just laughed out loud. I don't know why. Oh, doesn't sound particularly funny to me. <laughs> Did they notice? Oh, yes, they noticed. They looked perfectly astonished. It must have been a nervous reaction on my part. Wills have been rather on my mind lately. Are you staying down here much longer? I'm leaving tomorrow. Oh. Are you thinking of living at Hunterbury? No, I'm not. I think I shall sell the place if I can get a decent offer for it. That's a pity. Won't you regret giving up the house? Not any more. There's nothing there now but memories I want to put out of my mind forever. I must be going, Doctor. I've got a lot to do. <laughs> Just like old times. So nice of you to come back and look me up. <laughs> now, tell me all the news. How's life at Labra Court? Oh, well, it is fine enough. Oh, but it's not like Hunterbury. It's really out in the wilds. <laughs> the maids there are a rough and ready lot. <laughs> and what about your patient? Lord Rattery. Oh, he's no trouble. He had double pneumonia, but he pulled through. Oh, he's a nice, quiet gentleman. But um, there's something I've been dying to tell you. Yeah. You remember that old photograph Mrs. Wellman made such a fuss about? That old flame of hers? <laughs> what was his name? Lewis, that was it. Well, do you know what was the first thing I clapped eyes on when I went into the drawing room at Ladbroke Court? That very same photograph no. on the grand piano in a big silver frame. 
I asked the butler who it was, and he said it was Lady Ratteris' brother, Sir Lewis Rycroft. He was killed in the Great War. I was sure it was something like that. I asked, was Sir Lewis married? And he said yes, but his wife went into an asylum shortly after they were married. Oh. oh she's still alive, apparently. So why did Mrs. Wellman come into it? Well, he supposed they must have been fond of each other. <laughs> Mrs. Wellman would have been a widow by then. Mm. And they weren't able to marry because of the wife being in an asylum. And he was killed in 1917. Oh, oh it's sad, isn't it? Poor Mrs. Wellman. Mm. She didn't have much of a life. No. But I'm glad she's not alive to see what's happening now. Mm-hmm. Hunterbury is up for sale. No, well, I thought Miss Carlyle and Mr. Wellman were going to live there. That's what the old lady used to say. No chance of that now. The engagement is off. No. And do you know who was the cause of it all? Mary Gerard. Mary? Do you mean to say she... Uh... She didn't do anything, as far as I can judge. But he fell head over heels in love with her. And it hit Miss Carlyle very badly. Oh, so is he going to marry Mary? It doesn't look like it. He's gone abroad somewhere now. And what's Mary doing? She's in London, training to be a private nurse. And her father's on his last legs. He won't last much longer. Not that it stops him being as ill-mannered as ever. <laughs> he actually told me the other day that Mary wasn't his daughter. Never! Mr. Gerard, I said to him, I'd be ashamed to say a thing like that about your wife if I were you. And do you know what he said to me? No. You're nothing but a fool, Nurse Hopkins. <gasps> Charming, isn't it? More tea. I have drawn up the will exactly as you requested in your letter, Miss Carlyle. I didn't want to leave a lot of trouble behind me like Aunt Laura. Very wise, I'm sure. You'll see I've done precisely as you asked. Everything to be left to Roderick Wellman, absolutely. Yes, that is what I wanted. So, if you'd care to sign it... Uh... Mr Wellman is abroad at the moment, I understand. He sent me a postcard from Alassia a few days ago. Is there any news about the house? There is, indeed. There's been an offer from a Major Somerville. He's the new Member of Parliament for the area, I believe. He's prepared to go to 12,500, and I think you'd be advised to accept. Very well. He is anxious to get in as soon as possible, and he's willing to take the place furnished for three months, until the legal formalities have been accomplished. Well, in that case, I'd better get down there straight away. There are all Aunt Laura's papers to be sorted out. But what are we going to do about the lodge? I can't very well throw old Gerard out into the street. That won't be necessary, I'm afraid, Miss Carlyle. I understand he passed away yesterday. Oh. I don't imagine he'll be greatly missed. I'd be grateful if you'd write to his daughter and ask if she could get her father's things out of the lodge as soon as possible. She'll have to go down for the funeral anyway. Why, Miss Eleanor, this is a surprise. Mrs Bishop. I'd no notion you were here. If I'd known you were coming to Hunterbury, I'd have been there myself. Who's doing for you there? Have you brought someone down from London? I'm not staying at Hunterbury. I've got a room at the King's Arms. Is there anything I can do for you at the house? I I could come up with you if you like. Uh, Thank you, Mrs Bishop, but I'd rather tackle it by myself. One can do some things better alone. As you please, of course. That daughter of Gerard's is down here. She's staying with Nurse Hopkins. I did hear they were going over to the lodge this morning. Yes, I asked her to come down and see to that. Well, I must be getting on, Mrs Bishop. Goodbye, Miss Eleanor. Some paste for sandwiches, Miss Carlyle. What would you like? Salmon and shrimp, turkey and tongue, salmon and sardine, ham and tongue. In spite of their names, I always think they taste much alike. (laughs) Well, perhaps they are, in a way. Uh, People always seem to find them very tasty. I used to be rather afraid of eating fish paste. There have been cases of ptomaine poisoning from them, haven't there? I can assure you, Miss Carlyle, that this is an excellent brand. Most reliable. We never have any complaints. In that case, Mr Abbott, I'll have one pot of salmon and anchovy and one of salmon and shrimp. Good morning, Miss Carlyle. I got your letter. You'll find the side door open. I've unfastened the shutters and opened most of the windows. Thank you, Horlick. I was wondering... Yes? 
I was wondering whether you could put in a word for me with Major Somerville. He'll be wanting gardeners. Maybe he'll think I'm too young for Ed Gardner, but I reckon I know a tidy bit. And the gardens don't look too bad, considering I've been looking after him single-handed. Of course I'll recommend you, Horlick. You can rely on me to do all I can. Oh, thank you, Miss Eleanor. That's very kind of you. You can understand it's been a bit of a blow. Mrs. Wellman dying and the place being sold off so quick. We all hoped, you see, that the place would be kept on by the family. Well, that was my wish too, Horlick. But I'm afraid it wasn't to be. I'll do all I can for you. Thank you, miss. Do you know I don't have a single happy memory of this place? All I can remember is Dad going on at me all the while. Did he say anything, send me any message before he died? Oh, dear me, no. He was unconscious for the last few hours. I feel perhaps I ought to have come down and looked after him. However he may have treated me, he was my father. Now, listen to me, Mary. Whether he was your father or not doesn't enter into it. It's a waste of breath to go back over the past and sentimentalise. Come on. We haven't got all day. Where shall we start? Perhaps I ought to clear up all these papers first. Yes, you'd better. Extraordinary what rubbish people keep. Newspaper cuttings, old letters, receipted bills from years back. Oh, here's Dad and Mum's wedding certificate. St Albans, 1919. Marriage lines, they used to call them. But, look. What's the matter? Don't you see? In 1919, I was a year old. That means that father and mother weren't married until... until afterwards. Well, what of it? There's nothing you can do about it. Why worry about it now? I can't help it. It's such a shock. There's many couples that don't go to church till a bit after they should. But so long as they do it in the end, what's the odds? Is that why father never liked me? Because mother made him marry her? It wasn't quite like that, I imagine, Mary. What are you trying to say? You may as well know the truth now. You aren't Gerard's daughter at all. And that was why he hated me. I suppose so. You might think it wrong of me, but I almost feel glad. I've always felt uncomfortable because I didn't care for father. But if he wasn't my father, that makes it all right. Gerard talked about it a great deal before he died. I shut him up pretty sharply, but he didn't care. I wouldn't have said anything to you if this hadn't cropped up. I wonder who my real father is. Oh, who can that be? I hope I'm not intruding. Oh, good morning, Miss Eleanor. I wondered if you'd like to come up to the hall and have some lunch. I've made some sandwiches and there's enough for three. Oh, that's extremely thoughtful of you, Miss Carlyle. It is a nuisance to have to break off and go all the way back to the village when there's still so much to do here. That's just what I thought. It's very kind of you, Miss Eleanor. Then come over as soon as you're ready. Come in, won't you? Oh. What's the matter, Mary? Nothing. I was shivering. It's just coming in out of the sun. Oh, come on now. You'll be pretending there are ghosts next. I didn't feel anything. Let's go into the morning room. It looked so bright and cheerful with the sun streaming in through the windows. Poor old house. Doesn't know what's coming to it. Poor old house. Have a sandwich, Mary. Oh, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Hopkins. Sandwich? Oh, thank you. Mmm, how nice. Mm. Abbott was right, they're really quite tasty. I meant to make some coffee, but there isn't any. There's some beer, though, if anyone wants that. No, I'd sooner have a cup of tea. Oh, I always forget. I never take tea myself, but there's some in a little canister in the pantry. Then I'll just pop out and put the kettle on. It's already on. It should be nearly boiling by now. Oh. No milk, I suppose. I brought some with me. Well, then, I'll see to it. Have another sandwich, Mary. Thanks. Are you enjoying your work in London? Mm. Yes, thank you. I'm very... I'm very grateful to you. <laughs> you needn't be grateful. I didn't mean to... Why are you staring at me like that? Is something wrong? What should be wrong? I don't know. You look as if... I can't put it into words. <laughs> was I staring? I'm so sorry. I, I do that sometimes. Take no notice. I was miles away, years away... I was thinking of the games we used to play together when we were children. You and me and Roddy. Do you remember, Mary? Yes, I do. You'd come up from the lodge and we'd go upstairs into the nursery and we'd be lost there for hours. 
It was all so happy and carefree in those days. It's a pity that we can never go back. Would you like to go back? Oh, yes, Mary, I would. Miss Eleanor, you mustn't think that what I... What mustn't I think, Mary? I've forgotten what I was going to Here say. Here we are. Here's the tea. You poor Mary. Not for you, Miss Eleanor. No, thanks. I'm sure you won't refuse a cup, Ness. I never refuse. I hope I've not made it too strong for you, Mary. It looks fine, thanks. Oh, it's better than that terrible brew they give you at the Pixie Cafe. I can't understand how they get away with it. Are you sure you won't have a cup of tea, Miss Carlyle? Quite sure, thank you. Well, I'll just turn the kettle off then. I put it on in case we needed to fill up the pot again. Mary? Yes? Oh, nothing. Nothing. It's strange. I feel as though we were all waiting for something to happen. <sighs> We'd better get on. I'll take these things back into the kitchen. Oh, Miss Eleanor, let me. No, Mary. I'll do it. Oh, my word, it's hot in here. Yes, the pantry faces south. Oh, let me wash up, Miss Carlyle. You're not looking quite the thing. Oh, I'm all right. I'll dry. You've pricked yourself. No, oh, I did it on the rose trellis at the lodge. A thorn. I'll get it out presently. The rose trellis at the lodge. Roddy and I had a row once. We were playing York and Lancaster in the Wars of the Roses. We soon made it up. We were so happy then. And now what have I come to? Nothing but hatred and evil. I've been mad. Quite mad. Are you all right, Miss Carlyle? You don't look at all well. I'm fine, I assure you. I've sorted out some clothes upstairs, Aunt Laura's things. I thought perhaps you could advise me where they'd be most useful in the village. There must be someone who needs them. Of course, Miss Carlyle. I'll be up just as soon as I've finished these. And those will do for Mrs Parkinson. And these would come in very handy for old Nelly. That's more or less it, then. Yeah. I'll take them down to the village, if you like. I know where everybody lives. I can be getting on with that while Mary goes down to the lodge and finishes up there. She's only got a box of papers to go through. Where is she, by the way? Did she go back to the lodge? I've no idea. I left her in the morning room. Well, she'd not be there all this time, surely. We've been up here nearly an hour. What can have become of the girl? Well, I never. She's fallen asleep. It must be the heat. Wake up, my dear. Mary? What's all this? What is it? Is she ill? Where's the phone? Get hold of Dr. Lord as quick as you can. What's the matter, nurse? The matter? The girl's ill. She's dying. Dying? She's been poisoned. You are Eleanor Catherine Carlyle? I am. I have here a warrant for your arrest upon the charge of murdering Mary Gerard by administering poison to her on the 27th of July last. And I must warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence against you. She's been arrested and she's going to be put on trial for murder, Monsieur Poirot. I want you to find evidence that will prove she didn't do now, it. Now, just a moment, my friend. Not so fast. Who has been arrested? Who is going to be tried for murder? A young woman named Eleanor Carlyle. And why have you come to see me, Dr. Lord? I heard about you from a friend, Edward Stillingfleet. Ah, ah the good Mr. Stillingfleet. He told me what you did in the Benedict Farley case. How every mortal soul thought it was suicide and how you showed it was murder. And now you wish me to achieve the opposite, hmm? To prove that this murder was, in fact, suicide. I don't care what you prove. I just want you to get her off. Tell me, Dr. Lord, you and this young lady, you are in love with one another? Hmm? You are affianced, perhaps? <laughs> no such luck, I'm afraid. Ellen is in love with a long-nosed, supercilious ass. Damn bad taste and totally absurd, but there it is. I fell in love with her the moment I saw her. It's an old romantic cliché, but it's true. She's never given me a second thought. I love her, and I don't want her to be hanged. It's as simple as that. What is the exact charge against her? She's accused of murdering a girl called Mary Gerard by poisoning her with morphine hydrochloride. 
Haven't you read about it? It's been in all the papers. And what is supposed to be the motive? Jealousy. And in your opinion, she did not do it? No, of course not. She's not capable of it. Uh -huh. Almost everyone is capable of murder. It is the one crime for which you need no expertise. Now, what is it exactly that you want me to do? I've told you. I want you to get her off. I am not a defending counsel, my friend. I'll put it more clearly. I want you to find evidence that will enable her counsel to get her off. Hmm. You put this a little curiously. It seems simple enough to me. I want you to get Eleanor Carlyle acquitted. From what I've heard, you're the only man who can do it. You interest me, my friend. I think you had better tell me the exact facts of the case. But surely you've read the newspapers? I never go by what I read in the newspapers. Now come, Doctor, the facts. Your solicitor's here, Miss Carlyle. Oh, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Seddon. Hello, Eleanor. I should like to speak to my client alone, if you please. Of course, Mr. Seddon. I have good news for you, Miss Carlyle. Sir Edwin Bulmer has agreed to take on your case. Bulmer? Isn't he the one they call the forlorn hope? Quite appropriate in my case, I should have thought. But doesn't he specialise in sob stuff about the prisoner's youth and difficult upbringing? It won't wash in my case, Mr Seddon. I've never wanted for anything in my life. Sir Edwin intends to put forward the argument that there was no plausible motive for killing Mary Gerard. He'll assert that the engagement between yourself and Roderick Wellman was a family affair, entered into solely to please Mrs Wellman, and that the moment she was dead, you broke off the engagement of your own accord. <laughs> I broke it off. Roderick Wellman has agreed to give evidence to that effect. But it's not true. I loved him. I think you should let Sir Edwin be the best judge of the way in which your case is handled, Eleanor. Oh, I suppose you're right. But that day when I invited Mary Gerard and Nurse Hopkins, I felt a kind of black hatred for Mary. I'd been talking to Horlick, the, the gardener, and he said how they'd all hoped that Hunterby would be kept on by the family. And I thought how much Roddy and I had always loved the house, how we'd always felt sure that we would live there together someday. And now I was packing the place up to be sold to a stranger. And why? Because of Mary Gerard. And I thought, if only she never existed... I think you should put all those thoughts out of your mind. I wanted to put an end to her existence, Mr Seddon. I really believe I may have done so. By the time I got there, Mary Gerard was unconscious. I did all I could, but it was no good. The autopsy revealed that a large dose of morphine had been taken a short time previously, and the police found a torn scrap of a label with morphine hydrochlor on it, just where Eleanor Carlyle had been spreading the sandwiches. How very convenient. Did Mary Gerard eat or drink anything else? She and the district nurse drank tea with the sandwiches. Nurse Hopkins made it. Couldn't have been anything there. Of course, I understand the defence will make a song and dance about the sandwiches, saying that since all three ate them... It would have been impossible to ensure that only one person should be poisoned. Mm, I'm afraid that will not help the young lady. Now, just think for a moment. You make a plate of sandwiches. In one of them is the poison. You offer the plate. In our state of civilization, it is a foregone conclusion that the person to whom the plate is offered will take the one which is nearest. I presume that Eleanor Carlyle handed the plate to Mary Gerard first? Exactly. Although the nurse, who was an older woman, was in the room? Yes. Mm. That does not look very good. It doesn't mean a thing, really. You don't stand on ceremony when you're having a few sandwiches for lunch. Now, was there anyone else in the house? No one. Ah, oh, it is bad, that. And the dead girl had nothing but the tea and the sandwiches? Nothing. Her stomach contents tell us that. But why choose that particular poison? The symptoms of morphine poisoning are not in the least like those of food poisoning. Atrophine, surely, would have been a better choice. Yes, I suppose you're right. There's something else. Apparently, the district nurse lost a tube of morphine. When? Oh, weeks earlier. The night old Mrs. Wellman died. The nurse says she left her case in the hall at Hunterbury and found a tube of morphine missing in the morning. She has only remembered it since the death of Mary Sherard? No, as a matter of fact, she did mention it at the time, to the nurse on duty. Oh, it gets worse and worse. The case against Eleanor Carlyle seems to be very grave indeed. You mean you won't help me? Have I said that I will not? 
You will take the case? Of course. Then we should get down to Maidenford at once. Can you come today? I think that might be managed. We can catch a train around 12.30. I'll pick you up in a taxi in an hour's time. Monsieur Poirot, there's something else that you ought to know. Ah, something you hesitated to tell me until I was safely inside the taxi? Put it like that if you like. Uh -huh. The police have applied for an exhumation order. They want to dig up old Mrs. Wellman. Why should they wish to do that? And when they do, they'll probably find what they're looking for. Morphine. How do you know that? I've suspected it for some time. Ah, mon dieu, I do not understand you, doctor. You knew when she died that she had been murdered? No, of course not. I never dreamed of such a thing. I thought she'd taken it herself. You thought that the old lady had killed herself? She talked about it. She asked me more than once if I couldn't put an end to the suffering she was going through. Were you surprised by her death? I must admit I hadn't expected it just then. I sent the nurse out of the room and made as thorough an investigation as I could. Of course, it was impossible to be sure without an autopsy. And I didn't see that it would do any good. If she had taken a shortcut, why create a scandal? So you signed the death certificates? I wanted her to be buried in peace. And I never dreamed for one moment of foul play. I was quite sure she'd done it herself. But she was bedridden. How did you think she could have got hold of the morphine? I hadn't the least idea. She was a clever, resourceful lady with remarkable determination. Could she have got it from one of the nurses? Good No. <laughs> you obviously don't know nurses. Oh, well, from her family. Possibly. She might have worked on their feelings. Now, you said that Mrs. Wellman died intestate. If she had lived, would she have made a will? You certainly know how to ask the right questions, Monsieur Poirot. She was anxious to make a will, got quite agitated about it. She couldn't speak intelligibly, of course, but she managed to make her wishes clear. Eleanor Carlyle was to have telephoned her lawyer first thing the following morning. So, Eleanor Carlyle knew that her aunt wanted to make a will. And if her aunt died without making one, she would inherit everything. But she didn't know that. She had no idea that her aunt hadn't made a will. How can you be sure of that? That is what she says, but she may have known. <sighs> Look here, Poirot, are you the prosecuting counsel? At the moment I am, my friend. If I am to help you, I must know the full strength of the case against Eleanor Carlyle. Thank goodness we managed to get a compartment to ourselves. Since we have so much to discuss, I'm sure our fellow passengers would have been fascinated. Now, as to the circumstances of the death of Mary Gerard, we are sure it was the sandwiches? It could scarcely have been the tea. Nurse Hopkins drank it as well as Mary Gerard. So the morphine was in the sandwiches and no one else handled them except Eleanor Carlyle. No, that's not quite accurate. Ah. Uh -huh. Not accurate. You said nobody but Eleanor Carlyle handled the sandwiches. You don't know that. But you said there was no one else in the house. As far as we know. But you're excluding a short period of time during which she left the house to go down to the lodge. During that time, the sandwiches were on a plate in the pantry, and somebody could have tampered with them. You're right, my friend. I admit it. You would make a very good detective. So, we must try to form some idea of who that somebody could be. And what was the motive? Tell me, did anyone other than Eleanor Carlyle stand to gain anything by Mary Gerard's death? Had she, for instance, any money to leave? Not at the time. In another month, she would have had £2,000. Eleanor Carlyle was making that sum over to her because she believed her aunt would have wished it. But the old lady's estate isn't wound up yet. Then we can wash out the money angle. So, let us consider other possible motives. Now, Mary Gerard was beautiful, by all accounts. With beauty, there are always complications. She had admirers? She may have done. I wouldn't know. Who would know? Well, Nurse Hopkins would be your best bet. Ever since she came to Maidenford, she's made it her business to know everything that's going on. Then perhaps I should start with her. My car's at the station. I'll drive you over there when we arrive. Another cup, Mr. Poirot? Uh, no, thank you, nurse. I think it's one of the most terrible things I've ever known to happen. Mary was such a lovely girl. With those looks, she could have been a film star. And she was a nice, steady girl, too, not stuck up. Though she easily could have been with all the notice taken of her. What, you mean the notice taken of her by Mrs. Wellman? That's just what I mean. The old lady taken a tremendous fancy to her, really tremendous. Uh, do you find that surprising? Well, that depends. 
Might be quite natural, really. I mean... Uh, well, what I mean is, Mary had a very pretty way with her nice, soft voice and pleasant manners. And in my opinion, it does an elderly person good to have a young face about. Mm. Miss Carlyle came down occasionally, I suppose, to see her aunt, eh? Miss Carlyle came when it suited her. Oh, you do not like Miss Carlyle? Like her? How could I like her? She poisoned the poor girl. You are quite sure it was she who administered the poison to Mary Gerard? Well, who else could have done it? There were only the three of us there. You're not suggesting I did. Oh, no, not for one moment. But her guilt has yet to be proved, remember. She did it all right. Apart from anything else, you could see it in her face, the way she kept looking at Mary hmm. and taking me upstairs and keeping me there all that while, delaying as long as possible. And then when I turned on her after finding Mary lying there like that, it was there in her face as plain as could be. She knew I knew. Ah, it certainly is difficult to see who else could have done it. Unless, of course, she did it herself. What, do you mean to say that Mary might have committed suicide? One can never tell. The heart of a young girl is very sensitive, very tender. It would have been possible, I suppose, hmm? She could have slipped something into her tea without you noticing her. But slipped it into her cup, do you mean? Yes. You could not have been watching her all the time. Well, I suppose she could have done it. But why should she? What would she want to do a thing like that for? An unhappy love affair, perhaps? Oh, girls don't kill themselves for love affairs nowadays. Not unless they're in the family way. And Mary wasn't that, let me tell you. And she was not in love? Not she. Quite fancy-free. But she was a beautiful girl. She must have had admirers. There was Ted Bigland, of course. Ted Bigland? A local boy lives on his father's farm. He was very gone on Mary. But she was a cut above him. I told her so myself. He must have been angry when she would not have anything to do with him. He certainly was. Blamed me for it, too. But I'd a perfect right to advise Mary. After all, I know something of the world... I didn't want her to throw herself away. What made you take such an interest in the girl? What? Well, oh, I don't know. There was something, well, romantic about Mary. Well, she was the lodgekeeper's daughter, was she not? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, of course. At least... Hmm? You are being very mysterious, nurse. As a matter of fact... She wasn't old Gerard's daughter at all. He told me so himself. Her father was a gentleman. I see. And her mother? Her mother had been lady's maid to old Mrs. Wellman. She married Gerard after Mary was born. As you say, most romantic. But perhaps you know who her real father was? Well, perhaps I could make a guess. Old sins have long shadows, they say. No, but I'm not one to talk, and I, I shan't say another word. There is something else I wish to ask you about, a delicate matter. But I am sure I can rely on your discretion. I'm sure you can, Mr Poirot. It is about Mr Roderick Wellman. Oh. He was, I have heard, attracted by Mary Gerard. Quite bowled over. Although at that time he was engaged to Miss Carlyle. If you ask me, he was never really sweet on Eleanor Carlyle. And did Mary Gerard... Um, Encourage his advances? Oh, she behaved like a lady. Nobody could say she led him on. Was she in love with him? No, she wasn't. But I suppose in time something might have come of it? It might have. But Mary wasn't one to do anything in a hurry. She told him straight out that he'd no business to speak to her like that when he was engaged to Miss Eleanor. And when he went to see her in London, she said the same. What do you yourself feel about Mr. Roderick Wellman? <laughs> He's a nice enough young fellow. Nervy, though. Was he very fond of his aunt? As far as I know. Did he sit with her much when she was so ill? What do you mean after she'd had her second stroke? Mm -hmm. I don't believe he even went into her room. Really? Mrs. Wellman never asked for him. And, of course, we'd no idea the end was so near. There are a lot of men like that, you know, can't abide to come face to face with serious illness. They can't help it. Are you sure Mr. Wellman did not go into his aunt's room before she died? Well, not while I was on duty. Nurse O'Brien relieved me at 3 a.m., but if she did see him go in, she never mentioned it to me. He may have gone into her room while you were absent. I don't leave my patients unattended, Mr. Poirot. Oh, no, 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 of course not, nurse. Forgive me. Ah, you have been most helpful. 
Now, there is nothing else you can tell me about Mary Gerard? I don't know anything. Are you quite sure? You don't understand. I was fond of Mary. How did you get on? Miss Hopkins certainly knows more than she is prepared to tell me at present. She is holding something back. It is not necessarily an important thing. It may have no bearing on the crime. But there is something definitely damaging or detrimental to the character of Mary Gerard. Hmm. Did you find out if there are any other boyfriends? She mentioned a certain Ted Bigland. Ted? <laughs> he works at the garage. We might just catch him. So you're trying to find out who really killed Mary? It's a total mystery to my mind. You do not believe that it was Miss Carlyle who killed her then? Miss Ellen is a lady. She's not the kind of person you can imagine doing a thing like that. It isn't likely, is it? It is not likely. But jealousy can make even ladies do violent things. I don't see Miss Carlyle doing anything like that. But Mary Gerard died, and she did not die a natural death. Now, have you any idea? Is there anything you can tell me to help me find out who killed Mary Gerard? It doesn't seem right. It just doesn't seem possible that anyone could have killed Mary. She was like a flower. But even so... I know she didn't die natural, but I've been wondering. Yes, Mr. Bigland? I've been wondering if it couldn't have been some kind of accident. An accident? Ah, it is interesting that you should feel that. I dare say it doesn't make much sense to you. It's just a feeling I've got. Feeling is sometimes an important guide. Now, you will pardon me if I seem to tread on painful ground. But you cared very much for Mary Gerard, did you not? Everyone round here seems to have got to know about that. You wanted to marry her. Yes. But she was not winning. I suppose people meant well. But they shouldn't muck up people's lives by interfering in them. It changed Mary. She was spoiled and bewildered. She didn't fit into any kind of world. She was too good for me, but she still wasn't good enough for a real gentleman like Mr. Wellman. You do not like Mr. Wellman? Why the hell should I? He's all right in his way, I suppose, but he's not what I call much of a man. I could pick him up and break him in two. He's got brains, I suppose, but that's not much help to you when your car breaks down. Now, you were working here in the garage when... Uh... When this murder happened? I was testing out a car for a gentleman. I choked somewhere, but I couldn't find it. Seems odd to think of it now. It was a lovely day. Some honeysuckle still in the hedges. Mary used to like honeysuckle. I forget what I said about Mr. Wellman. I was angry because he was always hanging around Mary. He ought to have left her alone. She wasn't his sort. Not really. I didn't expect you'd get much out of him. One of nature's innocence, I'd have thought. He said she was like a flower. Nurse Hopkins said she could have been a film star. You won't find Mrs. Bishop quite so starry-eyed about her. Ah, she was Laura Wellman's housekeeper. Hmm. She's staying at her sister's. I'll take you round there now. Uh, there's just one problem, though. Oh, what is that? She doesn't particularly care for foreigners. <laughs> and a foreigner I indubitably am. <laughs> Tell me, who does she like? Uh, the royal family. She's got books and books of newspaper cuttings. Ah, by a remarkable coincidence, I was called only last month to sort out a little mystery at Sandringham. And you actually met the little princesses, Mr. Poirot? Oh, they were... Utterly charming, oh. immaculately well-behaved, but so full of vitality and enjoyment. It's such a relief to see decent family values. <laughs> it is a relief, certainly. Now, tell me, Mrs. Bishop, was the engagement of Miss Carlyle and Mr. Wellman a great relief to your mistress? It was something she'd always hoped for. Uh, the engagement was perhaps entered into partly to please her? Oh, I wouldn't say that, Mr. Poirot. Miss Ellen has always been devoted to Mr. Roddy, and he to her. And yet the engagement was broken off. Owing to the machinations of a certain little snake in the grass. Indeed. In this country, Mr. Poirot, there's certain decency to be observed when mentioning the dead. 
But that young woman was underhand in everything she did. But I had been given the impression that she was a simple, unassuming girl. Oh, people were taken in by her all right. My poor dear mistress above all. Mary Gerard wormed her way into her confidence, always hanging about, reading to her, bringing her little nosegays of flowers. Mm -hmm. The money she spent on that girl. Expensive schools, sending her abroad. The girl nothing but old Gerard's daughter, and making up to Mr Roddy the way she did, but he was too simple to see through her. Ah, you interest me exceedingly, Mrs Bishop. I have at last... A clear picture of Mary Gerard. Well, I'm not saying anything against the girl. But there's no doubt she caused a lot of trouble. Uh, where would it have ended, I wonder? You can take it from me, Mr Poirot, that if poor Mrs Wellman hadn't died when she did, I don't know what might have been the end of it. That girl was making the old lady turn from her own flesh and blood. You mean that Mrs Wellman would have left all her money to Mary Gerard? Wouldn't have surprised me. That's what a young woman was working up to, I've well, no doubt. But wickedness doesn't always flourish. True. Mary Gerard is dead, and the circumstances of her death seem quite inexplicable. Do you know, the police even tried to drag me into it, because I said Miss Eleanor's behaviour was peculiar. But was it not? Because she didn't want me to go to the hall with her. Mm. Why shouldn't she? Miss Eleanor was going to turn out her aunt's things, and that's always a painful business. But it would have made it much easier for her if you had accompanied her. I wanted to, Mr Poirot, but she took me up quite sharp. She was always a very proud and reserved young lady. I wish, though, that I had gone with her. Yes, it is said. Ah, the things we wish we had done which haunt us after someone's death. Doubtless Mr. Roderick Wellman must blame himself for not going to see his aunt that last night, even though he could not have known she would pass away so soon. Oh, but you're quite wrong, Mr. Poirot. I can tell you for a fact that Mr. Roddy did go to his aunt's room. Oh? I was just outside on the landing myself. I, I heard Nurse Hopkins go off downstairs, and I thought maybe I'd better make sure the mistress wasn't needing anything. You know what nurses are, always staying downstairs to gossip. <laughs> anyway, I thought I'd see everything was all right, and it was then that I saw Mr Roddy slip into his aunt's room. <sighs> I don't know whether she knew him or not, but he hasn't got anything to reproach himself with. I've booked you a room at the King's Arms, Poirot. I hope that's all right. I fear you will have to cancel it, my friend. I am going back to London. You're not giving up the case. Oh, no, Dr. Lord, I am not. It is just that it is essential for me to have a little word with Mr. Roderick Wellman. But you'll be coming back. Oh, yes, Doctor. I shall be back. what they're saying about Mrs. Wellman. And what would that be? I've heard they've dug the old lady up, and there's traces of morphine in her. Morphine? So it was murder, then? Murder. I little doubt who did it. Come. Come away. Come away. Death. And in sad Cypress let me Fly away, breath. I am slain by a fair, cruel maid. It does not displease you, I hope, Mr. Wellman, that I should endeavor to be of assistance to Miss Carlyle? Uh, no, of course not, but... Uh... But what can I do? Is it that that you would ask? Seems a little rude, put like that. Uh, but really, of course, that is the point. Uh, what can you do? I can search for the truth. Will you assist me by telling me just what you think of the whole business? What can I say? The mere idea of Eleanor actually doing such a melodramatic thing as poisoning someone is laughable. 
But how do you explain that to a jury? You are a person, Mr. Werman, of sensibility and intelligence. The facts condemn Miss Carlyle. Your knowledge of her acquits her. What then really happened? I suppose the nurse couldn't have done it. She was never near the sandwiches. Oh, yes, yes, they have made very minute inquiries. And she could not have poisoned the tea without poisoning herself as well. Moreover, why should she wish to murder Mary Gerard? Why should anyone wish to kill her? Yes, that seems to be the unanswerable question in this case. No one wished to kill Mary Gerard, and yet she was killed. I am sorry, but a detective must ask questions about people's private affairs, about their feelings. It is widely known that you admired Mary Gerard. That is true? Yes. You fell in love with her? I, I suppose so. Must we go on with this? One cannot always turn aside from unpleasantness. You say you suppose you care for this girl. You are not sure, then? I don't know. She was so lovely, like a dream. And now everything is finished. Gone as though it never happened. You are not in England at the time of her death? Uh, no. Uh, I went abroad on July the 9th and didn't get back until August the 1st. Mm -hmm. Eleanor's telegram followed me about from place to place. I hurried home as soon as I got the news. It must have come as a great shock to you. <sighs> Why do these things happen to one? What did you really know of Mary Gerard, Mr. Wellman? What did I know? So little, I see that now. She was beautiful and gentle, but really I knew nothing about her, nothing at all. That's why I don't miss her, I suppose. Was she the kind of girl who would make enemies unconsciously? No. I can't imagine anyone disliking her. Really disliking her, I mean. Well, spite is different. Spite? Why do you say that? Well, there must have been, to account for that letter. What letter? An anonymous letter. Huh? To whom was it written? It was sent to Eleanor. It said that someone was sucking up to Aunt Laura and warned us to look after our interests. It obviously referred to Mary Gerard. When was this? A few weeks before Aunt Laura died. We went down straight away. Can I see the letter? As a matter of fact, I burned it. Ah, uh, uh, this is most unfortunate. Why did you do that? It seemed the natural thing to do at the time. And in consequence of this letter, you and Miss Carlyle went hurriedly down to Hunterbury? Well, it went down, yes. I don't know about hurriedly. You went down there with Miss Carlyle? Yeah. At that time, your aunt had not made a will. Shortly afterwards, she has a stroke. She then wishes to make a will, but conveniently for Miss Carlyle, perhaps. She dies the night before the will can be made. What are you hinting at? You have said that Eleanor Carlyle is emphatically not the kind of person to be involved in the death of Mary Gerard, but... Mm -hmm. There is now another interpretation. Eleanor Carlyle had reason to fear that she might be disinherited by an outsider. The letter has warned her. Her aunt's broken murmurings confirm that fear. In the hall below is an attaché case with various drugs and medical supplies. It is easy to abstract a tube of morphine, and afterwards, so I have learned, she sits in the sick room alone with her aunt while you and the nurses are at dinner. But that's for... Now, there was only one person, you realise, who would benefit by Mrs. Wellman's dying at that moment. I thought you were on her side. No, 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 no. Whatever side one is on, one must face facts. Now, you must try to think. Who could have given the morphine to her? You must admit that Eleanor Carlyle had the best opportunity to do so. What about the nurses? Well, either of them could have done so, certainly, but they had nothing to gain from her death. That's true enough. Then... There is yourself. Me? You could have given the morphine to Mrs. Wellman. Is it not true that you were alone with her in her room for a short period that night? Yes, I slipped in to look at her, but, but what? why should you kill her? <laughs> Only two people had a motive to kill Mrs. Wellman. Two people? Yes. One was Miss Carlyle. And the other? The other was the author of the anonymous letter. Why should that be? Somebody wrote that letter. Somebody who hated Mary Gerard, or at least disliked her. Somebody who did not want Mary Gerard to benefit from Mrs. Wellman's death. Now, have you any idea who the writer of the letter might be? I've no idea. But, but was my aunt necessarily murdered at all? And couldn't she have taken the morphine herself? It is an idea, yes. She often said she wished she could die. But then she could not have risen from her bed, gone downstairs, and helped herself to the morphine from the nurse's case. No, but but somebody could have got it for her. So, so, somebody who... What is it? 
You have remembered something, have you not? Yes. But you but wonder if you are to tell me. Well, yes. It was something that Miss Carlyle said, yes? It was when she was telling me about Aunt Laura's second stroke. Um, Eleanor said how terribly sorry she was for her, and how the poor dear hated being ill, and that now she would be more helpless still, and that it would be absolute hell for her. She said that people ought to be set free if they really wanted it. Mm. Just now, Mr. Wellman, you dismiss the possibility of Miss Carlyle having killed your aunt for monetary gain. Do you also dismiss the possibility that she may have killed Mrs. Wellman out of compassion? I can't. I, I want to, but I can't. Yes. Yes, I thought I was sure that you would say that. Ah, Dr. Lowe, how kind of you to meet me. Kindness, nothing. I'm desperate for news. Are you staying long? No, I'm afraid not. I have to go up to London again tomorrow. I have a meeting with Miss Carlyle. You're seeing her in prison? Oh, well, they would scarcely allow me to see her anywhere else. And even that was difficult to arrange. Her solicitor was most obstructive and did not want me to see her. The police were unable to give me any assistance. Fortunately, the Home Secretary owes me a little favour. The car's here. Thank you. Well? No, it is not very well. You haven't got hold of anything? Eleanor Carlyle killed Mary Gerard out of jealousy. Eleanor Carlyle killed her aunt to inherit her money. Eleanor Carlyle killed her aunt out of compassion. My friend, you may make your choice. Oh, that's nonsense, Poirot. You really don't think it is possible that Eleanor Carlyle was unable to bear the sight of her aunt's suffering and help put an end to it? I can't deny that it's possible, but I don't think she'd be so carried away by pity as to lose sight of the risk. She'd know that she could be accused of murder. Ah, uh, you may be right. But isn't there anything? Any chink of light at all? My investigations always lead me back to the same place. No one stood to gain by Mary Gerard's death. No one hated her except Eleanor Carlyle. There is one thing, though. A piece of the puzzle that is missing. Have you ever heard of any gossip against Mary Gerard? You're thinking of what Nurse Hopkins told you. Exactly. Or rather, what she didn't tell you. She was fond of Mary, and there is something about Mary she does not want known. That is to say, there is something against Mary that she is afraid I will find out. She does not think it has any bearing on the crime. But you see, it is imperative that I should know everything. Mm. For it may be that there was a wrong done by Mary to some third person. And in that case, that third person might have a motive for desiring her death. But if Nurse Hopkins won't tell you what it is, how are you going to find it out? There is one other person who might be able to help me. Who is that? Nurse O'Brien. She is a great friend of Nurse Hopkins. And I doubt whether the garrulous Hopkins could refrain from giving at least a hint to her about something that was occupying her mind. Nurse O'Brien may know something. I heard a rumour that the old lady died of morphine poisoning. Is it true? Is that why you wanted to talk to me, Mr Poirot? Did you yourself have any suspicion at the time? Oh, not the least in the world. Though perhaps I should have with Dr. Lord sending me here, there, and everywhere for things he didn't need. But he signed the certificate for all that. Now, there is a suggestion that Mrs. Wellman might have committed suicide. Suicide? And her lying there, helpless? She could just about manage to lift one hand. Someone might have helped her. Oh, I see what you mean. Miss Carlyle, or Mr. Wellman, or, or even Mary Gerald. It would be possible, would it not? Did not have dared, any of them. No, perhaps not. When was it that Nurse Hopkins missed the tube of morphine? It was that same morning, after the old lady died. I'm sure I had it here, Hopkins said. Very sure she was at first, but well, you know how it is. After a while, your mind gets confused. And in the end, she decided she must have left it at home. And even then, you had no suspicion? It never entered my head for a moment. And what do you think now? Well... If they have found morphine in Mrs. Wellman, 
There's little doubt who took the tube. You have no doubt at all that Eleanor Carlyle killed Mary Gerard? There's no question of it at all, to my mind. Well, who else had the reason and the wish to do it? Mm. Now, you are, I think, a very discreet woman, Nurse O'Brien. I'm not one to be talking of what doesn't concern me. You and Nurse Hopkins, you have agreed together, have you not, that there are some things which are best not brought out into the light of day. What would you be meaning by that? Oh, nothing to do with the crime, or crimes. No, I mean the other matter. Oh, well, what would be the use of raking up mud in an old story? And she, a decent elderly woman with never a breath of scandal about her, and dying respected and looked up to by everybody. As you say, Mrs. Wellman was much respected in Maidenfall. Mm, and it's so long ago, too. It's all dead and forgotten. <laughs> I've a soft spot for romance myself, and tis hard for a man who's got a wife in an asylum to be tied all his life with nothing but death that can fray him. Uh, yes. Mm. Yes, it is hard. <clears throat> Tell me, did Mary Gerard know about this? Well, who'd be telling her? Not I, and not Hopkins. After all, what good would it be to her? What indeed? Fifteen minutes, Mr Poirot, that's all you're allowed. Thank you. You'd like to be left alone, I take it. If you please. I have been sent to you by Dr Lord. He thinks that I may be able to help you. Dr. Lord? Mm -hmm. How strange. It was very thoughtful of him and very kind of you to come and see me, but I don't think there's anything you can do. Will you answer my questions, Miss Carlyle? Believe me, it would be better not to ask them. I am in very good hands. My defence has been entrusted to a famous counsel. I am quite famous too, in my way. Oh. And I know your counsel very well. He has a great reputation for defending criminals. I have a great reputation for demonstrating innocence. Do you believe that I'm innocent? Are you? Is that a sample of your questions? It's very easy, isn't it, to answer yes. Hmm. You are very tired, are you not? Yes, that more than anything. I shall be glad when it is over. You have heard, perhaps, the result of the autopsy on your aunt's body? She died of morphine poisoning. I did not kill her. Did you help her to kill herself? Did I help? Oh, I see. No, I did not. Did you know that your aunt had not made a will? No, I had no idea. And you yourself, have you made a will? Yes. How have you left your fortune, Miss Carlyle? I've left everything to Roddy, to Roderick Wellman. Does he know that? Certainly not. Who else knows the contents of your will? Only my solicitor, Mr. Seddon, and his clerks, I suppose. You sent your instructions to Mr. Seddon in a letter? Well, how else would I do it? Did you post the letter yourself? No, it went in the box from the house with the other letters. You wrote it, put it in an envelope, sealed it and stamped it. You did not pause to reflect, to read it over. I read it over, yes. I'd gone to look for some stamps. When I came back with them, I just reread the letter to be sure I'd put it clearly. Was anyone in the room with you? Only Roddy. Could he have read that letter while you were out of the room? I can assure you that Roddy doesn't read other people's letters. Hmm. Now, when did the idea of killing Mary Gerard first come to you? When you saw her making her will? Did Dr. Lord tell you about that? It was then, wasn't it? It struck you how funny it would be and how convenient if Mary Gerard should happen to die. He knew. He looked at me and he knew. Now, there is not much time. It is necessary that you tell me just what happened that day when Mary Gerard died. Come now, commence. You met your housekeeper, the good Mrs. Bishop. She wanted to come and help you. You would not let her. Why? I wanted to be alone. Why? 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 Because I wanted to think. To think or to imagine. What did you do next? I bought some paste for sandwiches. Two pots? Two. And you went to Hunterbury. And what did you do there? I went up to my aunt's room and began to go through her things. Continue. I came down to the pantry and I made the sandwiches. And you thought What? I thought of my namesake, Eleanor of Aquitaine. I understand perfectly. Do you? Oh, yes. I know the story. She offered fair Rosamond, who was the mistress of her husband, the choice of a dagger or a cup of poison. Rosamond chose the poison. What next? I went down to the lodge and invited Mary and Nurse Hopkins up to the house. 
We had the sandwiches in the morning room. And you were still in the dream. Yes. I left Mary standing by the window. I went into the pantry. Nurse Hopkins was doing the washing up. I noticed a mark on her wrist. She said it was a thorn from the rose trellis by the lodge. <laughs> the roses by the lodge. Roddy and I had a quarrel once about the Wars of the Roses. I was Lancaster and he was York. It all came back to me and something broke. The black hatred went away. I didn't hate Mary anymore. I didn't want her to die. But later, when we went back into the morning room, she was dying. Will you ask me again, did I kill Mary Gerard? I shall ask you nothing. There are some things I do not wish to know. This is getting to be quite a habit. Which is very good of you to put yourself out for me, Doctor. I've done my best to get answers to your questions. Mm -hmm. First, Mary Gerard left for London on July the 10th. Second, I haven't got a housekeeper. A couple of giggling girls run my house. I think you must mean Mrs Slattery, who was my predecessor's housekeeper. She'll be in all day if you want to call on her. What do you want from her? Gossip. Talk about the old days. Some crimes have their roots in the past, and I'm beginning to think that this one may have. Oh. And then you wanted to go over to Hunterbury. Mm. I could take you there now, if you like. It beats me why you haven't been there already. I should have thought the first thing to be done in a case like this was to visit the place where the crime happened. Why? Well... Isn't it the usual thing to do? Oh, one does not practice detection with a textbook. One uses one's natural intelligence, the little grey cells. Then why do you want to go out there now? Because now I know exactly what I am looking for. Do you think there might be something there still? I have an idea we shall find something, yes. Something to prove Eleanor's innocence? I did not say that. You don't mean you still think she's guilty? You must wait, my friend. Before you get an answer to that question? Look here, Poirot, I might have no idea what you're driving at. Why keep me in the dark? Because as yet there is no light. I am always brought up short by the fact that there was no one who had any reason to kill Mary Gerard except Eleanor Carlyle. Oh, you can't be sure of that. She'd been abroad for some time, remember, working as an au pair. Yes, 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 I have made the inquiries. You mean you went over to Germany? Myself, no. I have my spies. Can you depend on other people? Certainly. It is not for me, Hercule Poirot, to run here and there, doing amateurishly the things that for a small sum someone else can do with professional skill. Mm. I can assure you, mon cher, I have several irons in the fire. I have some useful assistants. One of them, a former burglar. What do you use him for? Well, the last thing I used him for was to make a very thorough search of Roderick Wellman's flat. What were you looking for? One always likes to know exactly what lies have been told one. Did Wellman tell you a lie? Definitely. Who else has lied to you? Everybody, I think. Nurse O'Brien romantically, Nurse Hopkins stubbornly, Mrs. Bishop venomously. You yourself. You surely don't think I've lied to you? Not yet. Uh... I thought we'd park the car at the lodge. Do you want to look round it? Why not? Nothing much there. No, it has little to tell us. But um, this is the rose which Nurse Hopkins mentioned. Oh. Do you know the name of it, my friend? No. It is Zephyrine Drugan, and I begin to see a little glimpse of light. Or not daylight, but the little glimpse of light one gets in a train when one is about to come out of the tunnel. <laughs> what do you mean? No, no, no. No, Doctor. Not yet. Let us walk up to the house. Yes, I'll show you the way. That's the window of the pantry where Eleanor Carlyle was cutting the sandwiches. And from here, anyone could see her cutting them. Mm. The window was open, if I remember rightly. It was wide open. It was a hot day. Then, if someone wished to watch unseen what was going on, somewhere about here would be a good place. It is concealed from the path, and that opening in the shrubs gives one a good view of the window. Now, what did he do, our friend who stood here? Hmm? Did he perhaps smoke? Uh, 
Ah, here we are. What is it? A matchbox, my friend. An empty matchbox, trodden heavily into the ground. It's foreign. Good Lord, German matches. And Mary Gerard had recently come from Germany. Well, we've got something now, you can't deny it. Perhaps, but it is not quite so simple as you think. There is one great difficulty. Do you not see it yourself? No. Ah, <sighs> if you do not see it for yourself. But come, let us go into the house. It was on this table that Eleanor Carlyle cut the sandwiches. The fragment of the morphine label was found in this crack in the floor under the sink. Hmm. The police are careful searchers. They do not miss much. There's no evidence that Eleanor ever handled that tube. I'm sure that someone was watching her from the shrubbery outside. She went down to the lodge and he saw his chance. He crushed some of the tablets of morphine to powder and put them into the top sandwich. He never noticed that he had torn a bit off the label on the tube. And still you do not see. Ah, it is extraordinary how dense and intelligent man can be. What do you mean? It's so simple, really. Ah, do you not see, my friend, the fatal fallacy in your reasoning? No. According to your theory, someone, a man presumably, who had known Mary Gerard in Germany, came here intent on killing her. He stood in the shrubbery. And what did he see? A window. And at that window, a girl cutting sandwiches, Eleanor Carlyle. But think for a minute. What on earth was going to tell the watching man that those sandwiches were going to be offered to Mary Gerard? So, if a man stood there watching and afterwards climbed in and tampered with the sandwiches, he could only have intended to poison the girl he saw at the window. Eleanor Carlyle. Well, Mr. Poirot, what do you want now? I have come to ask you for the truth. I'd like to know what you mean by that. I spoke up about that missing tube at the inquest, when many a one in my place would have sat tight and said nothing. I did not suggest that there is anything about the crime which you have not told. Then um, what did you suggest? I asked you to tell the truth, not about the death, but about the life of Mary Gerard. Oh, so that's what you're getting at. But it's got nothing to do with the murder. I did not say it did. But you are withholding knowledge just the same. Well, why shouldn't I, if it had nothing to do with the crime? I can only surmise. You have, I believe, actual knowledge. I don't know what you mean. I will tell you what I have learned. I have had hints from Nurse O'Brien, and I have talked with Mrs. Slattery, who has a very good memory for things that happened over 20 years ago. I have learned of a love affair between two people. One of them was Mrs. Wellman, who had been a widow for some years, and who was a woman capable of a great and passionate love. The other party was Sir Lewis Rycroft, who had the great misfortune to have a wife who was hopelessly insane. The liaison between these two people was, I think, guessed at, but they were both discreet and careful to keep up appearances. Then Sir Lewis was killed in action. Well? I suggest that there was a child born after his death, and that child was Mary Gerard. You seem to know all about that it. That is what I think. But it is possible that you have got definite proof that it is so. You're right, Mr. Poirot. I have. I'll tell you how it came into my hands. After Mary died, I finished clearing up the lodge... And amongst old Gerard's things, I came across this letter. You can see what is written on it. Huh. For Mary, to be sent to her after my death. But this was written years ago. It wasn't Gerard who wrote that. You're not so clever as you think you are, Mr. Poirot. Huh? It didn't happen the way you said. This letter was meant for Mary, but the old man put it away among his things, and so she never saw it, and I'm thankful she didn't. She was able to hold up her head to the end. If I may, I should like to keep this letter. What are you going to do with it? Well, they're all dead now. All this old scandal, it would be cruel. Let the dead rest in peace in their graves, that's what I say. One has to consider the living. But this has got nothing to do with the murder. On the contrary, Nurse Hopkins, I believe it may have 
everything to do with it. Eleanor Catherine Carlyle, you stand charged upon this indictment with the murder of Mary Gerard upon the 27th of July last. Are you guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Come, come away, come away, death. And in sad Cyprus, let me. Fly away, breath. I am slain by a fair, cruel maid. Mm-hmm. If it were anyone but you, Poirot, I'd have shown him the door. I'm not accustomed to be told how to conduct my oh, case. That is the last thing in the world I wish to do, Sir Edwin. Hmm? I simply want to make one or two little suggestions. You remember the Putnam affair? I've spent the last five years trying very hard to forget it. <laughs> if it hadn't been for one of your little suggestions, I might have let an innocent man go to the gallows. So, far away, Poirot, what have you found out? I cannot prove the innocence of Eleanor Carlyle, but I can suggest another person who had an equal opportunity to commit the murder and who had a far more convincing motive. Hmm? We may have to fly in a witness from abroad. Fly in? There's not a minute to be lost. The trial opens in five days' time, does it not? Yeah. And what, in your opinion, was the cause of death? Death seemed to me to be consistent with morphine poisoning. Thank you, Dr. Lord. Have you any questions for this witness, Sir Edwin? I have, my lord. Uh, You were the late Mrs. Wellman's medical adviser, were you not, Dr. Lord? I was. During your visits to Hunterbury in June last, you had occasion to see the accused and Mary Gerard together? Several times. What would you say was the manner of the accused towards Mary Gerard? Perfectly pleasant and natural. You never saw any signs of this jealous hatred we've heard so much about? No, never. Thank you, Dr. Lord. I would estimate the amount of morphia taken by the deceased to be about four grains. And what would constitute a fatal dose? As little as one grain. Thank you, Dr. Garcia. Your witness, Sir Edwin. I should like to get one thing quite clear, Doctor. You found in the stomach nothing but bread, butter, fish paste, tea and morphine. There were no other foodstuffs. None. Am I right in understanding that the morphine could have been taken in the fish paste or in the bread or in the butter on the bread or in the tea or in the milk that had been added to the tea? Certainly. And, in fact, the morphia might have been taken separately. It could simply have been swallowed in its tablet form. That is so, of course. Nevertheless, you are of the opinion that however the morphine was taken, it was taken at the same time as the other food and drink? Yes, Thank you. One jar of fish paste, which had already been washed, was standing on the draining board in the pantry. Another half full was on the table. In a further search of the kitchen, we found a tiny scrap of paper. Uh, This is Exhibit C. Could you pass it to the jury, please? What did you take it to be, Inspector? A fragment of a printed label, such as are used on glass tubes of morphine. Thank you, Inspector. Your witness, Sir Edwin. Inspector Brill, you say you found this scrap in a crack in the flooring? Yes. Did you find the rest of the label? No. What was the state of that scrap of paper when you found it? Was it clean or dirty? There was surface dust on it from the flooring, but it was quite clean otherwise. You would say then that it had come there on the actual day you found it, not earlier? Yes, I would. Nurse Hopkins, will you tell us why you carried the morphine in your attaché case? Well, one of the patients in the village needed hypodermic injections of morphine morning and evening. What were the contents of the tube? There were 20 tablets, each containing half-grain morphine hydrochloride. Uh, Will you pass the witness exhibit C? 
Do you know what that is, Nurse Hopkins? It's a bit of a label. Uh, can you tell the jury what label? Oh, yes. It's part of a label off a tube of hypodermic tablets. Morphine tablets. Half grain, like the one I lost. You are sure of that? Of course I'm sure. It's off my tube. Is there any special mark on it by which you can identify it as the label of the tube you lost? Um, no, my lord, but it must be the same. Well, actually, all you can say is that it is exactly similar. Well, yes, that's what I mean. And what little suggestions have you for me today, Poirot? You are to cross-examine Nurse Hopkins this morning, is that so? Yes, she's first on. Now, there are two matters on which you might perhaps draw her out. The first, of course, is the will. And the second? The second is the rose tree. It is most important that we must establish exactly to which tree she is referring. Wasn't it rather careless to leave the attaché case in the main hall of Hunterbury House and leave it there all night? Yes, I have to admit that it was. And it's a fact, isn't it, that anybody in the house could have got at that morphine if they'd wanted to? I suppose so. I suppose about it. It's true, isn't it? Well, uh, yes. But it wasn't only Miss Carlyle who could have got it, was it? Any of the servants could, or Dr. Lord, or Roderick Wellman, or Nurse O'Brien, or Mary Gerard herself. Well, yes, I suppose so. You told Nurse O'Brien in the morning that the morphine was missing. Yes. I put it to you that what you really said was, I have left the morphine at home, I shall have to go back for it. No, I didn't. You didn't suggest that the morphine had been left on the mantelpiece in your cottage? Well, when I couldn't find it, I thought that's what must have happened. You make rather inaccurate statements sometimes, don't you? No, I, no, I don't. I'm very careful about what I say. Did you make a remark about a prick from a rose tree on July the 27th, the day of Mary Gerard's death? Well, I, I don't see what that's got to do with it. Is it, in fact, relevant, Sir Edmund? Uh, yes, my lord. It is an essential part of the defence. I intend to demonstrate the unreliability of the witness. Proceed. Do you still assert that you pricked your wrist on a rose tree on July the 27th? Yes, I do. And what rose tree was this? A climbing rose just outside the lodge. It's got pink flowers. You're sure of that? I'm quite sure. And you still persist in saying the morphine was in the attaché case when you came to Hunterbury on the day of Mrs. Wellman's death? I do. I had it with me. Is it a matter of fact that on Thursday, July the 6th, the dead girl, Mary Gerard, made a will? She did. Why did she do that? Well, because she thought it the proper thing to do. Is this the will, signed by Mary Gerard, witnessed by Emily Biggs and Roger Wade, confectioner's assistants, and leaving everything of which she died possessed to Mary Riley, sister of Eliza Riley? That's it. To your knowledge, had Mary Gerard any property to leave? Oh, not then she hadn't. But she was shortly going to have. Yes. Is it not a fact that a considerable amount of money, £2,000, was being given to Mary Gerard by Eleanor Carlyle? Yes. There was no compulsion on Miss Carlyle to do this? It was entirely a generous impulse on her part? She did it of her own free will, yes. But surely, if she had hated Mary Gerard, as it is suggested, she would not of her own free will have handed over to her a large sum of money. Well, that's as may be. What do you mean by that answer? I don't mean anything. Exactly. No further questions. <clears throat> uh, Nurse Hopkins, uh, when Mary Gerard was discussing with you the wording of this will, did the accused look in through the window? Yes, she did. And will you tell us what she said? She said, so you're making your will, Mary. That's funny. And she laughed, laughed and laughed. And it's my opinion that at that moment the idea came into her head, the idea of making away with Mary Gerard. Confine yourself to answering the questions that are asked you. The last part of that answer is to be struck out. A little sherry. Thank you. We open the defence tomorrow. Witnesses all lined up? Yes, they will be there. Another rum selection. Chemist, gardener, and a visitor from down under. And your humble self. Yes, I must consider what to wear for the occasion. Oh, I think you ought to see this. What is it? It is a copy of an entry in Roderick Wellman's passport. It is a fundamental law of evidence that if it can be shown that there is an alternative theory which is possible and consistent with the evidence, the accused must be acquitted. I propose to show you that there was another person who had not only an equal opportunity to poison Mary Gerard, but who had a far better motive for doing so. But first, I will call the prisoner, that she may tell you her own story, and that you may see for yourselves how entirely unfounded the charges against her are. Mr. Wellman was like a brother to me, or a cousin. 
I always thought of him as a cousin. So it was not perhaps what might be called a passionate affair. Well, no. You see, we knew each other so well. Now, Miss Carlyle, I want to go over the events of the 27th of July. You made the sandwiches and went down to the lodge to invite Nurse Hopkins and Mary Gerard to share them with you. What happened when you arrived back at the house? We went into the morning room. I fetched the sandwiches and handed them to the other two. Did you drink anything with them? I drank water. Nurse Hopkins and Mary had tea. Who made it? Nurse Hopkins. She went out to the pantry to make it. She brought in the tray and Mary poured it out. Did you have any? No. But Mary Gerard and Nurse Hopkins both drank it? Yes. What happened next? Nurse Hopkins went and turned the gas ring off. Leaving you alone with Mary Gerard? Yes. And what happened next? After a few minutes, I picked up the tray and the sandwich plate and carried them into the pantry. Nurse Hopkins was there and we washed up together. Did you make a certain remark to her about a scratch on her wrist? I asked her if she'd pricked herself. What did she reply? She said it was a thorn from a rose tree outside the lodge. What was her manner at the time? I think she must have been feeling the heat. She was perspiring and her face was a queer colour. What happened after that? We went upstairs and she helped with my aunt's things. What time was it when you came down again? It must have been an hour later. And where was Mary Gerard? She was sitting in the morning room. She was breathing very queerly and was in a coma. I rang up the doctor on Nurse Hopkins' instructions. By the time he got there, it was too late. Miss Carlyle, did you kill Mary Gerard? No. No, I did not. I would say that Eleanor was deeply attached to me, but certainly not passionately in love with me. Will you tell the jury, Mr. Wellman, exactly why your engagement was broken off? Well, after Mrs. Wellman died, it pulled us up, I think, with a bit of a shock. I didn't like the idea of marrying a rich woman when I didn't have a penny. Actually, the engagement was dissolved by mutual consent. We were both rather relieved. Now, will you tell us just what your relations were with Mary Gerard? I thought her very lovely. Were you in love with her? Just a little. And when was the last time you saw her? Uh, it must have been the 5th or 6th of July. You saw her after that, I think? No. I went abroad to Venice and Dalmatia. You returned to England when? When I received a telegram. The 1st of August, it must have been. But you were actually in England on July the 27th, I think. No. You are on oath, Mr. Wellman. Is it not a fact that your passport shows that you returned to England on July the 25th and left it again on the night of the 27th? Well, uh, yes, that is so. Will you tell us why you returned? I went to see Mary Gerard at her lodgings in London. I asked her to marry me. And what was her answer? She refused me. You're not a rich man, Mr. Wellman. No. And you are rather heavily in debt. What business is that of yours? Were you not aware of the fact that Miss Carlyle had left you all her money in the event of her death? This is the first I've heard of it. Were you in Maidenford on the morning of July the 27th? I was not. I have no more questions. You say, Mr. Wellman, that in your opinion the accused was not in love with you. Not passionately, I think you said. That is what I said. Are you a chivalrous man, Mr. Wellman? I don't know what you mean. If a lady were deeply in love with you and you were not in love with her, would you feel it incumbent upon you to conceal the fact? Certainly not. Where did you go to school, Mr. Wellman? Eton. That is all. Mr. Wargrave, you are a rose grower and live at Emsworth in Berkshire. That is so. Did you, on October the 20th, go to Maidenford and examine a rose tree growing at the lodge at Hunterbury Hall? I did. Will you describe the tree? It was a climbing one, Zephyrin Druin. Bears a sweetly scented pink flower. And can you tell the jury what is particularly remarkable about this rose? It has no thorns. It would be impossible to prick oneself on a rose tree of this description. It would be quite impossible. It's a thornless tree. Thank you, Mr. Wargrave. Have you any questions, Mr. Atterbury? Uh, none, my lord. James Arthur Littledale. And your occupation? I'm a qualified chemist. I work for Jenkin and Hale. They are wholesale chemists. Will you tell me what this scrap of paper is? It is a fragment of one of our labels. What kind of label? 
The label we attach to tubes of hypodermic tablets. Is there enough of the label left for you to say definitely what drug was in the tube to which this label was attached? Yes. I should say quite definitely that the tube in question contained hypodermic tablets of ipomorphine hydrochloride, one twentieth grain. Not morphine hydrochloride? No. No, it could not be that. On such a tube, the word morphine is spelled with a capital M. The end of the line of the M here, seen under a magnifying glass, shows plainly that it is part of a small M, not a capital M. Will you tell us what are the properties of apomorphine hydrochloride? Apomorphine is the quickest and most powerful emetic known. It acts within a few minutes. So, if two people were to share the same sandwich or drink from the same pot of tea, and one of them were to inject a dose of apomorphine hypodermically, what would be the result, supposing the shared food or drink to have contained morphine? The food or drink, together with the morphine, would be vomited by the person who injected the apomorphine. And that person would suffer no ill effects? No. My name is Amelia Mary Sidley, and I live at 17 Charles Street, Boonamba, Auckland. Do you know a Mrs Draper? Yes. I've known her for over 25 years. You happen to know her maiden name? Yes, I do. I was at her wedding. Her name was Mary Riley. Is she a native of New Zealand? No, she came out from England. Have you seen this Mary Riley, or Draper, in court? Yes. Where did you see her? Giving evidence in this box. Under what name? Jessie Hopkins. Are you quite sure that Jessie Hopkins is the woman you know as Mary Riley or Draper? Not a doubt about it. I suggest to you, Mrs. Sedley, that you may be mistaken. I'm not mistaken. You may have been misled by a chance resemblance. I know Mary Draper well enough. Jessie Hopkins is a certified district nurse. Mary Draper was a hospital nurse before her marriage. You understand, do you not, that you are accusing a crown witness of perjury? <sighs> I understand what I'm saying. In the light of Mrs. Sedley's evidence, I think that Jesse Hopkins should be recalled. Your Lordship, Jesse Hopkins left the court a few moments ago. <laughs> Monsieur Poirot, do you recognise this document? Certainly. How did it originally come into your possession? It was given to me by District Nurse Hopkins. Would you be so good as to read it to the court? For Mary, to be sent to her after my death. This is the truth I've written down in case it should ever be needed. I was lady's maid to Mrs. Wellman at Hunterbury, and very kind to me she was. I got into trouble, and she stood by me and took me back into service when it was all over. But the baby died. Mrs. Wellman told me that she herself was going to have a child. The father was Sir Louis Rycroft. They couldn't marry because he had a wife already, but she was in a madhouse, poor lady. Sir Lewis was killed in the war. Mrs. Wellman went to Scotland and took me with her. The child was born there, at Ardlochry. Bob Sherard, who had washed his hands of me when I had my trouble, was writing to me again. The arrangement was that we would marry and live at the lodge and that he should think the baby was mine. Mrs. Wellman gave us both a handsome sum of money, but I would have helped her without that. I've held my tongue and never said anything to anybody, but I think it is right that I should put this down in black and white. Eliza Gerard, born Eliza Riley. It follows, as his lordship will doubtless instruct you, that Mrs. Wellman's next of kin was not her niece, Eleanor Carlyle, but her illegitimate daughter, Mary Gerard. And therefore, Mary Gerard, at Mrs. Wellman's death, inherited a vast fortune. But she herself was unaware of the fact. She was also unaware of the true identity of the woman, Hopkins. Now, we know that at Nurse Hopkins' instigation, Mary Gerard made a will leaving everything she had to Mary Riley, sister of Eliza Gerard. We know that Nurse Hopkins, by reason of her profession, had access to morphine and apomorphine and was well acquainted with their properties. Furthermore, it has been proved that Nurse Hopkins was not speaking the truth when she said that her wrist had been pricked by a rose tree. Why did she lie if it were not that she wanted hurriedly to account for the mark just made by the hypodermic needle. Remember, too, that the accused has stated on oath 
that Nurse Hopkins was looking ill, perspiring, and her face was a strange colour, comprehensible enough if she had just been violently sick. I will underline another point. If Mrs. Wellman had lived twenty-four hours longer, she would have made a will, and in all probability that will would have made a suitable provision for Mary Gerard, but would not have left to her the bulk of her fortune, since it was Mrs. Wellman's belief that her unacknowledged daughter would be happier if she remained in another sphere of life. Looked at from that point of view, gentlemen of the jury, I submit that the case against Eleanor Carlyle falls to the ground. Gentlemen of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? We are. Look upon the prisoner at the bar and say whether she is guilty or not guilty. Not guilty. I want to go somewhere quiet for a while. Somewhere where there won't be any staring faces. That's all arranged. I've got you a room in a sanatorium. Quiet place, lovely gardens. No one will bother you or get at you there. Oh, thank you. That's just what I want. And thank you for all you've done. Oh. Without you, I'd probably have ended up with a rope round my neck. It was Hercule Poirot. The fellow's a kind of magician. No, it was you. You got hold of him and made him take the case. Did you know I hadn't done it? Or weren't you sure? <laughs> I was never quite sure. It seems so queer now. Like a kind of possession. That day I made the sandwiches, I was pretending to myself. I was thinking... I've mixed poison with this, and when she eats, she will die, and then Roddy will come back to me. Is there much difference between thinking and doing murder? All the difference in the world. If you think murder long enough, you suddenly come through the blackness and feel that it's all rather silly. <laughs> Which is just what happened. You're such a comforting person. You'll come and see me in the sanatorium, won't you? Of course. Often? As often as you want me. It was the moment when we drew up outside the lodge. I saw the rose tree, and I saw that it had no thorns. So, Nurse Hopkins had told a lie, and the lie was so pointless that it focused my attention on her. I began to ask myself certain questions. Who did the morphine that was stolen belong to? Nurse Hopkins. Who could have administered the poison to Mrs. Wellman? Nurse Hopkins. But why did she call attention to the disappearance of the morphine? Because she had already planned the murder of Mary Gerard and decided on her scapegoat. But that scapegoat had to be shown to have had a chance of getting the morphine. Hopkins deliberately left her attache case in the hall at Hunterbury all night and then told O'Brien that the morphine was missing. It was Hopkins who wrote the anonymous letter. To create bad feelings between Eleanor Carlyle and Mary Sherrard. But how on earth did you cotton on to her motive? I remember that I had heard that when Mary Sherrard first spoke of becoming a nurse, she told everyone that it was in her blood and that she had an aunt in New Zealand who was a nurse. And then, when I saw the letter written by Mary's mother, the whole pattern of the crime became apparent. But what was it about the letter that gave you the clue? Do you remember the way it began? For Mary, to be sent to her after my death. Why sent, not given? And then I saw the real truth. It was written, not for Mary Sherrard, but for Mary Riley in New Zealand. Oh, oh Sherrard must have sent a letter on to her in Auckland. And from then on, she began to work out how she could put her knowledge of Mary's real birth to her advantage. She came back to England and set to work. And got herself the job of district nurse in the village. She persuaded Nurse O'Brien to let her share the nursing of Mrs. Wellman. She found the opportunity to go through Mrs. Wellman's papers and found a letter from her solicitor urging her to make a will. Hopkins realized that if the old lady were to die intestate, her illegitimate daughter Mary would eventually inherit. So when she heard that the old lady wanted to see her solicitor, she murdered her. Exactly. And then she persuaded Mary to make out a will in favour of Mary Riley, her mother's sister. After that, Mary was doomed. She had to die, 
but in circumstances that would throw suspicion onto Eleanor Carlyle, and Eleanor Carlyle provided Hopkins with the opportunity. But all this was supposition. How could you be so sure? I found out through my spies that this was not the first time that Mary Riley had been involved in matters of this kind. The New Zealand police had been watching her for some time. An old lady who had left her a very snug little bequest had died under very suspicious circumstances, and Mr. Draper, her husband, died very suddenly after insuring his life in her favour for a very considerable sum. But how on earth would she have got hold of Mrs. Wellman's inheritance? Oh, she had all that carefully worked out. Nurse Hopkins would quietly disappear after the trial and surface in South Africa as Mary Riley. She would then write to the solicitors, saying that she had read about the trial and about her niece's murder, and then, in course of time, she would inherit. <laughs> you certainly know your job very well indeed, Monsieur Poirot. That is true. But you did not believe I was getting anywhere in my investigations, did you, Doctor? <sighs> and you were afraid, too, that your Eleanor Carlyle might, after all, be guilty. And so, with great impertinence, you lead me up the garden path, literally. But, mon cher, you were not very clever about it. In future, I advise you to stick to the measles and the whooping cough <laughs> and leave crime detection alone. Did you know all the time? You lead me by the hand to a clearing in the shrubbery, and you assist me to find a German matchbox that you have just put there. C'est l'enfantillage. Oh, well. I suppose Eleanor and Roderick Wellman will live happy ever after. My dear friend, you suppose nothing of the sort. Why not? She'll forgive him the Mary Gerard business. No, 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 no. It goes deeper than that. There is sometimes a deep chasm between the past and the future. When one has walked in the valley of the shadow of death and come out of it into the sunshine, it is a new life that begins. The past will not serve. She'll never love me the way she loved him. Perhaps not. But she needs you because it is only with you that she can begin life in the world again. Why don't you drive over to the sanatorium. <laughs> <laughs>